between 29 roughly and they say in, in 1931 the railroads lost about 50% plus of their passenger service. Some of them decided uh, that were the executives with these railroads that something desperately needed to be changed. And they were looking for motive power that would be more streamlined and uh, more uh, conducive to the travel of the customer uh, accommodations. And uh, two railroads in particular were very active and it was Union Pacific which was the other half of the Transcontinental Railroad when it was built in the 1860s. The other one was the Burlington Railroad, the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad. The Union Pacific, uh, they started out designing, and we'll see, uh, uh, let's have that next slide, Elaine. Now I apologize for this one, we just cut off a little bit, I hope it shows up better. That was the Union Pacific's attempt. They had that built with the Pullman Company. The Pullman Company, just to give you some information that you, I think you'll find, especially from a historical standpoint, if you didn't know it, the Pullman Company manufactured the Pullman cars. They serviced the Pullman cars at their at various major cities, and they staffed them. The conductor on a Pullman car or cars was a Pullman employee, so was the porter, the car attendant. They were employees of the Pullman company. They had an excellent job in the wrong thing, which we'll talk about later. But anyhow, uh, the Union Pacific went with the Pullman company, and the Pullman company uh, was active in trying to develop this type of train. It's a streetcar train, it was a bright called. Uh, 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 a arm and yellow, I think, on the side and the top and the bottom were a light brown. At the same time, the Burlington Railroad was very interested too. In fact, they were in a contest, if you can believe it, over who was going to get to use the silly name Streamliner. And the uh, Burlington had a president who uh, actually he little history on Ralph Bud because he was an Iowa boy. And when he got out of school, he went into surveying and he worked for the railroads, establishing new trackage and that throughout the Midwest. He uh, matriculated into the uh, Great Northern Railroad, which was headed by uh, James Hill. Hill and uh, uh, the uh, banking committee in New York uh, had developed quite a combination. The, the uh, Great Northern Railroad actually was the holding company for the Northern Pacific Railroad eventually, very early in its age. The Burlington, the, uh, the Seattle, Spokane, and, and Portland Railroad, the Colorado Southern, and the Fort Worth and Denver Railroad, all those were a conglomerate and Hill's desire was to merge them but he never got that opportunity because of resistance from the other railroads. Like we have a lot of Rock Island fans in here, and Rock Island was one very opposed to that. And others, as you can understand, and the Union Pacific itself. The, uh, uh, it did merge though, just jumping ahead in 1970, it became the Burlington Northern. And that was a combination of the Hill Enterprises at that time. Ralph Budd uh, went and worked for the Great Northern, and when Stevens, Often a little tangent, the chief engineer, civil engineer for the uh, Great Northern Railroad was selected by Theodore Roosevelt to head up the canal project when we were building the, the Panama Canal. And the problem the French ran into there was, of course, illness. They, would, they had great engineering talent at that time when that uh, canal, canal was uh, being built and they made an attempt first. They built the Suez Canal and they also built uh, the Eiffel Tower, but they would send people over there to that area, if you've read about it, and they'd die in five days. <coughs> Due to the mosquito and the disease they were working with. Walter Reed solved that problem. The other problem was a dirt problem of moving it. And that's where Stevens came from the Great Northern Railroad down to help at Theodore Roosevelt's request to come down and help move the dirt and he did it with railroading 
and he brought Ralph Budd with him. Ralph Budd then after that matriculated on up to the Great Northern again, became president of the Great Northern Railroad, and then went to the subsidiary, the Burn Burlington. Ralph was uh, a very uh, foresight and interesting guy, and that's why I want to spend a little time. Plus, he was an Iowa boy. He was born and raised in the state of Iowa. Now, when he came in, he decided that the Edward Budd Company of Philadelphia made automobile parts, but they had also mastered a spot welding process on stainless steel. And he became very... Uh, enthusiastic about using stainless steel in uh, railroad applications. And so he uh, uh, engaged them to build a train. Now he let me flip it over and let's see one more. They called this a caterpillar, by the way, because of it. There's a nose shot of it. And some of them decided uh, that were the executives with these railroads that something desperately needed to be changed. And they were looking for motive power that would be more streamlined and more uh, conducive to the travel of the customer. They were looking for better uh, accommodations. And uh, two railroads in particular were very active. And it was Union Pacific, which was the other half of the Transcontinental Railroad when it was built in the 1860s. The other one was the Burlington Railroad, the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad. The Union Pacific, uh, they started out designing, and we'll see, uh, uh, that was the Union Pacific's attempt. They had that built with the Pullman Company. The Pullman Company, just to give you some information that you, I think you'll find, especially from a historical standpoint, if you didn't know it, the Pullman Company, manufactured the Pullman cars, they serviced the Pullman cars at their at various major cities, and they staffed them. The conductor on a Pullman car or cars was a Pullman employee. So was the porter, the car attendant. The Union Pacific went with the Pullman Company, and the Pullman Company uh, was active in trying to develop this type of aluminum. It's a streetcar train, it was a bright, called uh, 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 an arm and yellow, I think, on the side and the top and the bottom were a light brown. At the same time, the Burlington Railroad was very interested too. In fact, they were in a contest, if you can believe it, over who was going to get to use the silly name Streamliner. And the uh, Burlington had a president who uh, actually, he, little history on Ralph Budd because he was an Iowa boy. And when he got out of school, he went into surveying and he worked for the railroads, establishing new trackage and that throughout the Midwest. He uh, matriculated into the uh, Great Northern Railroad, which was headed by uh, James Hill. Hill and uh, uh, the uh, banking committee in New York uh, had developed quite a combination. The, the uh, Great Northern Railroad actually was the holding company for the Northern Pacific Railroad eventually, very early in its age. The Burlington, the, uh, the Seattle, Spokane, and, and Portland Railroad, the Colorado Southern, and the Fort Worth and Denver Railroad, all those were conglomerate and Hill's desire was to merge them but he never got that opportunity because of resistance from the other railroads. Like we have a lot of Rock Island fans in here, and Rock Island was one very opposed to that. And others, as you can understand, in the Union Pacific itself. The, uh, uh, it did merge though, just jumping ahead in 1970, it became the Burlington Northern. And that was a combination of the Hill Enterprises at that time. Ralph Budd uh, went and worked for the Great Northern, and when Stevens, Often a little tangent, the chief engineer, civil engineer for the uh, Great Northern Railroad was selected by Theodore Roosevelt to head up the canal project when we were building the, the Panama Canal. And the problem the French ran into there was, of course, illness. They, would, they had great engineering talent at that time when that uh, canal was uh, being built and they made an attempt first. 
they built the Suez Canal and they also built uh, the Eiffel Tower, but they would send people over there to that area, if you've read about it, and they'd die in five days. <coughs> due to the mosquito and the disease they were working with. Walter Reed solved that problem. The other problem was a dirt problem of moving it. And that's where Stevens came from the Great Northern Railroad down to help at Theodore Roosevelt's request to come down and help move the dirt. And he did it with railroading and he brought Ralph Budd with him. Ralph Budd then after that matriculated on up to the Great Northern again, became president of the Great Northern Railroad and then went to the subsidiary the Burn Burlington. Ralph was uh, a very uh, foresight and interesting guy and that's why I want to spend a little time. Plus he was an Iowa boy. He was born and raised in the state of Iowa. Now when he came in, he decided that the Edward Budd Company of Philadelphia made automobile parts, but they had also mastered a spot welding process on stainless steel. And he became very uh, enthusiastic about using stainless steel in uh, railroad applications. And so he uh, uh, Shot engage them yeah. to build the train. I put that that's now, a heavy weight next to it. We have a couple examples yeah. of uh, the early Burlington train, the original one, Zephyr, and a heavy weight car next to it. This is how people lined up. They lined up for blocks to go through this uh, original train of the Union Pacific and the Burlington one, which flip again, Elaine. And this is a model of it up here. I thought you might see an actual model of the Zephyr that was originally built and called the Pioneer Zephyr. And uh, they, would light, they were in uh, dozens of carpetings in these trains when they toured the country with them. And people would be blocks long in trying to get on them to see them. Now this design, so I don't forget, that had that nose. You've got to remember in the steam engine days, the railroads made them unique. If you were a railroad person, you could see a steam engine, you could almost identify what railroad that it was on by the characteristics that they had on them and that they did it with them. So when the diesels first came in and the other gas electrics, uh, they had some of their own designs. And this was the, this shovel nose is what it was referred as in the railroad uh, 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 terminology because of that slope front end in, uh, nose on it. It was all stainless steel and uh, it had the first <coughs> diesel engine, which is kind of an interesting thing and I might add one else before someone will come in and correct me. Actually, you should refer to them as gas electrics and diesel electrics because they had traction motors, electric traction motors on the trucks where the wheels were. So they're really a combination of a diesel engine which would drive them or a, a gas engine that would. But gas was very expensive and gas didn't go over real well. Real well. And the Union Pacific, to uh, win that race, did put a gasoline, it was a gas trade-off of an engine by the Winton Company that built it, which later was the electromotive division of General Motors. Uh, Ralph Budd, not having determined that he wanted the stainless steel, which was, you know, not as corrosive as aluminum. Not too many years ago, you heard about the uh, sheeting on a, uh, a uh, sorry, Hawaiian flight came off the aircraft. Well, that aluminum can react that way and doesn't have the corrosive ability of stainless steel. In fact, that M10,000 that was built by Pullman and run by the Union Pacific, fell apart, and in about 1942, it was decided the best thing to do is turn it into airplanes for the, for the war effort. <laughs> this train here, which the model is of it, this train here ran in regular service for the Burlington until 1960, when they ran it up to Chicago, put it in the Museum of Science and Industry as the first diesel train ever run. Uh, it sat by the submarine and then a wealthy uh, uh, person that had seen the Zephyrs in his youth 
paint to have it all refurbished and they put it inside. So if you want to go see it, it's there. And it's on hydraulics, so it simulates uh, the, the action of riding on a train. And in addition to that, it uh, has some Disney-type animation figures in it. I think they talk to you if you want. They don't seem to answer questions. But, uh, now, one other thing about that diesel engine. Diesel engines were used in the marine area and in some railroad applications, very slow, brute force type of applications. But Ralph Budd wanted an engine that would be capable of generating 100 mile per hour trains. And Kennedy, who was the chief engineer for the uh, General Motors, which was the electromotive division, and it's in LaGrange, Illinois to this day, they uh, took the challenge on. And the Ralph Budd wanted it within so many days, but he lost to the Union Pacific in the race. But he did get the first diesel-powered train in America, which spelled the death of the steam engine, because it worked so well. They even made a run, <clears throat> excuse me, they made a run early in its life, right almost out of the assembly plant, much probably to the heartache of a lot of uh, engineers that were with it, because it had never been tested thoroughly, and you maybe remember this or heard about it, made a run, we were talking, Brian and I were talking about it, from Denver, left Denver early in the morning and ran to Chicago and ended up in the Century of Progress in Chicago, and it made it almost fault free. Uh, the design of this and that, then the, the uh, railroad went on and built more of them, the Burlington Venom, and the name Zephyr came. I wanted to tell you that. The name Zephyr came about. They had lost the idea of using the streamliner, and the Union Pacific said they were the route of the streamliners. So Ralph Budd, reading uh, a book one evening, came across Zephyrus the goddess of the western wind. Their slogan was already the god of the western wind. Did I say a god of the western wind? And uh, uh, the uh, uh, term, the, the Zephyr term, because their other slogan was everywhere west, worked out real well. So Bud went in and said, look, we're going to call our trains the Zephyrs. And that's where it came from. That's where you wonder why in the world they got that name. So they were every lightweight streamlined train in the Burlington was a Zephyr. And we'll see some. Your Street, which you may remember it from later ones. There were two later ones made, but the original one of the Silver Street was made with that train. It involved trying to get an iron lung to someone's son out in, at Boulder Dam if you've seen it. I don't want to ruin the theme for you. <laughs> the Burlington immediately placed an order for two more. They had, there's a high traffic corridor between Chicago and Milwaukee uh, and Minneapolis. And uh, the Northwestern was on it and the Milwaukee was on it. And they competed because these trains would run up in the morning and back in the evening. So the Burlington had two of them they were going to have built. And they again were still with the shovel nose, which you'll see for a while. They were, uh, one would leave Chicago and go to Minneapolis in the morning, and one from Minneapolis in the morning would go down to Chicago. They were twins, in other words. And then they'd reverse that loop later on in the afternoon and come back. They would reach speeds of over 100 miles an hour. They went up along uh, Highway 30, you can see it, Big Rock, Hinkley, then over to Shabona, and then they split off to Oregon, Illinois, and then over to Savannah, and then that beautiful trip from Savannah up along the Palisades on the east side of the river to Minneapolis-St. Paul. They did find out when they did this and placed this order with the Bud Company, no relation, by the way, to uh, Ralph Bud. Edward Budd was not related to him. Uh, they found that an uh, Eastern Railroad had stuck in there and had an order placed with them, and it's the only other railroad they ever had that type of design. 
the, the Boston and Maine. And they built one identical to the original Zephyr, which later was called the Pioneer one. And uh, then they got these as soon as that order was completed by Bud for the Boston and Maine, and they got these for the Twin Cities. They were so heavily traveled that the Burlington immediately turned around. They were like the original Pioneer with only four cars, three or four cars, and they were sold out all the time. So they immediately turned around and asked for a seven car train to replace it from Bud. Now, the one thing you may notice and with the model, they had a lot of ideas. You'd say, boy, these, these seem foolish today. Uh, those especially with engineering background. They were articulated. In other words, two cars would sit on the same truck. Now, I'm sure it was done for one reason, economy, and because the weight was not that great. The heavyweight model of a car up here that was used before weighed as much as the entire train, the original train. And uh, uh, they would operate that way for some time, as you'll see, the, until they finally ran into the problem. And, and it made sense that, gee, if we got these coupled, when you have that, they're permanently coupled, basically. You've got to take a crane to separate them. So, Pretty soon it's going to sink in that, hey, this isn't practical. If the season demands a smaller train, we've got to be able to take cars out of it. But they couldn't do that for quite a while. They were articulated for quite a while, and so was the Union Pacifics. So it made quite a, quite a problem, <coughs> one in 9902. Now, this is the next, a view of the next uh, Twin Cities Zephyr. And you'll notice it has more cars in it. It had seven cars in it. Of course, there were two of them built, too. Next to it, though, I particularly had this slide in there because that is a steam engine, a Hudson that was converted like a lot of railroads did. They put stainless steel all over it. The engine crews didn't like it very well because they couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't hear each other. And in fact, the railroad people called it Alice Lagoon. It was, uh, there were two of them built, but they were to fill in for the uh, uh, diesel ones whenever they were in for maintenance or whenever they had trouble. You see them side by side here, the Twin Cities and the steam engine. But it was all stainless steel too. It was all covered with stainless steel. There were two of them. Their real name was, as I said, Aeolus. Okay, uh, okay, now we're seeing a view of the next train, and this is an interesting one, because now our Pullman company comes up again. Does anyone uh, remember what, uh, the, who the president after George Pullman was? Very important thing for a trivia contest. Robert Lincoln. Right, that's right. Robert Lincoln was the president of the Pullman company. And after George. And... Uh, Okay, now the, now the Burlington said, look it, we want to get our number one train, the Denver Zephyr, in the same <coughs> business as the other one. But we've got to build a bigger one and it has to have sleepers on it. But as I said earlier, the Pullman Company had a, a, a monopoly on the thing. In other words, they built them, they serviced them, and they staffed them. And when the Burlington did this with the Bud Company, Pullman said, that's fine, do what you want, but we're going to have nothing to do with it. And in fact, you know, Pullman, the name had become synonymous with a sleeper car. And in fact, what the, the uh, uh, Pullman people said was, and uh, Burlington originally put Pullman on the, the uh, sideboard, which would be above the windows. But Pullman said, no, you can't have that. You've got to put your own name up there, and we're not going to have anything to do with them because we didn't build them. The Burlington took them to court and uh, had filed a suit against them, which when the war started, World War II, they uh, were not able to uh, 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 finish it in the courts, and it lingered on until after the war. But after the war, the courts ruled that, oh, you've got to make up your mind. Are you going to be in the business of servicing these cars, or are you going to be in the business of Pullman, uh, or building them? And Pullman decided they wanted to build cars, 
not be in the servicing. So I think it was a consortium of 28 some railroads took over the business. They would lease them back to Pullman then to do services for them. But the, the uh, idea of Pullman being a uh, entity that controlled that much of the sleepers died. This uh, train here, the Denver Zephyr, there were two of them. One left Denver every uh, evening and one left Chicago every evening. The slogan was overnight, every night. And they ran seven days a week and they did have sleeper services, I say, on them. And they, they uh, that really represents, you think of the California Zephyr, but the Denver Zephyr was their number one train on early. This happens to be the last of the shovel nose efforts. Now the cars are disconnected. They're not articulated. You can see there's a truck under each end of the cars. This was the General Pershing Zephyr. It ran from St. Louis to uh, 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 Kansas City. Still though, they had the shovel nose, but it was the last one. The Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Firemen raised a very strong objection to that because in accidents, you can appreciate, they were right above and right on the front end, and they did lose some crews in some accidents. It was too dangerous. Secondly, they uh, 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 decided that, you know, this unique design and that while it marked their type of system, it, uh, it uh, the, well, let's go with the electromotive division of General Motors was starting to build a shelf type diesel now with kind of a bulldog nose, and we'll see some here in a minute. And the uh, Burlington decided that, okay, we'll stop, we'll stop using them. But they did an interesting thing when they did stop and they went to the uh, shelf type of locomotive. Everybody had their own paint scheme, but they were standard. You might have certain very undistinguishable features, dynamic brakes, other things might be on them depending on the desire of the railroad. But they, uh, uh, they built no more shovel noses. Engineers used to say on them too, you were so close to the tracks, they'd come, the ties would come flying by and you lose your concentration. That was another argument they had for getting rid of that. Now this is, for those that want to be technical, this is an E5. They were the only ones that were built and the Burlington continued to use total stainless, stainless steel on them. But now there's more protection in the nose uh, for the, the crew and that became, that type modified over the years became the standard thing of the electromotive division in LaGrange, Illinois and they built tons and tons of them. This here happens to be the Silver Streak, uh, the Silver Silver Streak, and uh, it was uh, uh, used in uh, service between Kansas City and I believe St. Joe and some other cities. And to show you they don't give up that desire. Now use your imagination and you can see you say, well where in the world did they get that paint scheme? Let me show you something. I don't. I won't show you something. You're going to have to do it yourself. Above the headlight, black out the windows in your mind. Don't think of them. Think of them as being gone. Now these were artificial. On the on the uh, earlier Zephyrs, they were air intakes. But the Berlin put those on there. Now if you take that out of there, I wish I could black it out for you. There's the window on the old shovel noses. See. There's the grills. Remember we're at the top of it? Yeah. The air intakes and the headlights. That's where the paint scheme came from. They just couldn't give it up. Uh, second Twin Cities, which you saw before. Move, move your microphone. microphone closer. Okay, sorry. Uh, that's the second Twin Cities again, articulated. It's got an E5 in front of it off the shelf, but they, the Burlington was the only one to buy E5s. Right behind it, though, is a very interesting car. Ralph Budd again. He, uh, uh, Ralph Budd, uh, with some of his cohorts, decided that the best view you ever got in a locomotive was right there, uh, going on the, uh, riding in it. So they decided to take one of their coaches, they tore the roof out of it, 
lowered the, the, the uh, floor, floor plan in it, in here, lowered the floor plan in it, and put a dome on it. That's the original Vista Dome. In Burlington terminology, it was the Silver Dome. They built an identical one like it, too, and then the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, then the uh, uh, Bud Company started building their own for them. From that point on, they didn't build any more. But they built two of them, and that's a picture of the original dome car. I had an uncle that the first dome I car to work to that, and he said they had some problem because every time they came to an overpass, the people would duck. Here is a picture of the third twin city. Now, the Burlington made it a Vista Dome train, which was really great because the scenery was just great riding up the east side of the Mississippi on the Palisades, all the way from Savannah to Minneapolis-St. Paul. This was the final Twin Cities, it was the third one, as I said, that they made. But this train became completely vista domed, and it was just a beautiful train to ride uh, until, of course, uh, Amtrak took over, and they did something different, and they don't ride on the east side, they go over on the west side of the river where the Milwaukee ran. Now, here's your friend. This is the one you wanted to see. Now, that's a later power unit. It has different design, but they kept the same paint job, if you notice. And uh, uh, this is your California Zephyr on its maiden run into Denver. Uh, and, sorry. The California Zephyr running into Denver on its maiden run. Now, the California Zephyr ran on the Burlington from, uh, and with Burlington Motive Power from uh, Chicago to Denver. Then the Western Pacific took up and took it over the Continental Divide through Moffat Tunnel to Salt Lake City. Then the Western Pacific took over on it and it went from Salt Lake City through the Feather River Canyon into San Francisco. Beautiful, beautiful ride. It was timed it wasn't like number one because uh, the Denver Zephyr had a very tight time schedule, so did the Twin Cities. But this was more for leisure. This was built more for leisure. Ralph Bud wanted this train for, you know, people to ride and enjoy it, enjoy the scenery. And so it was timed. It left Chicago in the afternoon, overnight it crossed over Iowa. Nebraska, not there in a lot of scenery there, but uh, on, the other, on the other hand, there isn't much. If you, but anyhow, then it would be in Denver in the morning, it would go through the Rocky Mountains, the Continental Divide during the daytime, and then it would reach Salt Lake City at night again, and then travel over some of the desert terrain and that, but you would be on the Feather River Canyon the next day and see that beautiful scenery of that uh, view. When Amtrak took over, if you think about taking it, it's still called the California Zephyr, when Amtrak took it over. But Amtrak goes up to Cheyenne and across on the northern side. The weather, Western Pacific trackage is not involved with it anymore. You don't get to see the Feather River Canyon on it, which is too bad. Okay. Switch it, yeah. I need new help. <laughs> this is the last slide. I wouldn't have said that earlier. <laughs> okay, uh, does anybody recognize this? Where you're at? Your Chicago the post office? Union Station. And what you got coming out here is the morning uh, Zephyr headed for Minneapolis-St. Paul, and here was the last of the Zephyr's new build. The Denver Zephyr is on your right, pulling into Chicago that morning from the overnight. Run from uh, Denver. And uh, the Railway Express is there, <coughs> uh, office at that time, or, or uh, staging area. Now one other thing I forgot to mention is that the Burlington of course, with association with the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific, carried their trains between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the Chicago. The North Coast Limited and the Empire Builder 
both came into Chicago from Minneapolis over the Burlington tracks and with Burlington crews and with locomotive power of the Burlington because they had that association too so it's nothing that uh, is surprising. Okay, uh, I think we covered it all probably faster than we need to, but I hope you have some idea where Zephyrs came from, and we didn't cover but half of the Zephyr fleet. There was, there was the rocket Zephyr, which ran from uh, St. Louis up to Minneapolis-St. Paul. From uh, St. Louis to uh, uh, Burlington, it was run on the Burlington. From Burlington, Iowa to Minneapolis-St. Paul, it was on the Rock Island Railroad. They also had an association down in in uh, uh, Texas where they shared it and that. But the Burlington never went bankrupt. The Burlington Railroad never went bankrupt. And it, and it carried the North, Great Northern and the, uh, its parents, the Great Northern, Northern Pacific. Now, I know there's a lot of Rock Island fans here, and I have no good at quick escape route. But the Rock Island Railroad, you know, went bankrupt three times. The Burlington never did. And, of course, it's certainly the connection with the Jim Hill Enterprises that he created with J.P. Morgan was very helpful to him in that they, uh, they lasted. But the Burlington did give a lot of money in dividends to keep the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific, their sister lines, alive during tough times. They were a very frugal group. The Burlington even took old gasoline, <coughs> excuse me, old gasoline lights that they'd used, you know, and they electrified them. And they put them on their steam engine. And if you're very familiar with them, you can see them. They look like they got the, they got the listing of being cuckoo clock lights. They were funny-looking lights. And, uh, but those were old gas lights. I know of one or two occasions when in some kind of ceremony or retirement, uh, the shop foreman at the roundhouse had an engine painted up with white rim tires and uh, other paraphernalia to make it look good. And the uh, foreman of the front roundhouse uh, caught him, at least in one case, and made him repaint the engine that night. <laughs> I, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions on this. And railroads, uh, I, I don't claim to be able to answer them all, but I'll try to if anybody has any questions. Does anybody recognize this? Where you're at? Your Chicago? Post office? Yep. Yep. Union Station. And what you got coming out here is the morning uh, Zephyr headed for Minneapolis St. Paul. And here was the last of the Zephyr's new build. The Denver Zephyr is on your right, pulling into Chicago that morning from the overnight. Run from uh, Denver. And uh, the Railway Express is there. <coughs> Uh, office at that time or, or uh, staging area. Now one other thing I forgot to mention is that the Burlington, of course with association with the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific, carried their trains between Minneapolis, St. Paul and the Chicago. The North Coast Limited and the Empire Builder both came into Chicago from Minneapolis over the Burlington tracks and with Burlington crews and with locomotive power of the Burlington because they had that association too so it's nothing that uh, is surprising. Okay, uh, I think we covered it all probably faster than we need to but I hope you have some idea where Zephyrs came from and we didn't cover but half of the Zephyr fleet. There was, there was the rocket Zephyr which ran from uh, uh, St. Louis up to Minneapolis-St. Paul. From uh, St. Louis to uh, uh, Burlington, it was run on the Burlington. From Burlington, Iowa to Minneapolis-St. Paul, it was on the Rock Island Railroad. They also had an association down in, in uh, uh, Texas where they shared it and that. But the Burlington never went bankrupt. The Burlington Railroad never went bankrupt. And it carried the North Great Northern and the, uh, its parents, the Great Northern, Northern Pacific. 
Now, I know there's a lot of Rock Island fans here, and I have no good at quick escape route. But the Rock Island Railroad, you know, went bankrupt three times. The Burlington never did. And, of course, it's certainly the connection with the Jim Hill Enterprises that he created with J.P. Morgan was very helpful to him in that they, uh, they lasted. But the Burlington did give a lot of money in dividends to keep the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific, their sister lines, alive during tough times. They were a very frugal group. The Burlington even took old gasoline, excuse <coughs> me, old gasoline lights that they'd used, you know, and they electrified them. And they put them on their steam engines. And if you're very familiar with them, you can see them. They look like they got the, they got the listing of being cuckoo clock lights. They were funny looking lights, and, uh, but those were old dance lights. Uh, and that they electrified them and they used them over. They're very, very, very cost conscious. Uh, I know of one or two occasions when in some kind of ceremony or retirement, uh, the shop foreman at the roundhouse had an engine painted up with white rim tires and uh, other paraphernalia to make it look good. And the uh, foreman of the front roundhouse uh, caught him, at least in one case, and made him repaint the engine that night. <laughs> I, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions on this. And railroads, uh, I, I don't claim to be able to answer them all, but I'll try to if anybody has any questions. <coughs> This H.O. size stands for half O, half of the O size train.